Welcome, my name is Cece Doucette and I extend my deepest gratitude to WCCA TV in Worcester for hosting us on our Tech Safe program. We are here to help the general public as well as our schools, our legislators, our town public servants learn about today's risks that come with wireless technology and most importantly to help teach solutions for how we can all use technology more safely. I am the director of Massachusetts for Safe Technology as well as the Education Services Director for the international nonprofit Wireless Education. And today we have a special episode to discuss an international initiative that was begun in France six years ago, and it's called World EHS Day. EHS stands for electro hypersensitivity, or the illness that people often get when they're overexposed to man made radio frequency, microwave radiation, and other forms of dirty electricity and man made energies. So with me today, I am so delighted to introduce you to one of my personal heroes. Her name is Courtney Gillardi, and Courtney comes to us from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and she will share with us how she got engaged in the wireless and tech safety issue. Again, none of us ever imagined this is where we would be today or how we would be spending our time, but we're so grateful when people come into this issue and do everything in their power to try and get this right, to protect ourselves, our families, our neighborhoods, and our communities. So please join me in welcoming Courtney Gillardi from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, by Zoom. Cece, thank you so much for having me today. I'm so grateful to you and for all you do, for all of the communities, for Massachusetts, for safe technology, all of the education and advocacy our, our neighbors behalf. Um, and on these bigger global efforts with um, bringing awareness about electromagnetic sensitivity and how people can be connected and protected with their technology use. Very good. So, Courtney, how did you get engaged in this issue? Well, unfortunately, um, I became engaged in this constructed um, at the top of my street in my neighborhood. Uh, this was back in um, March of 2020 when the cell tower started transmitting. My children, myself, and many of my neighbors started experiencing symptoms, headaches, nausea, dizziness, um, not being able to sleep, insomnia, um, my daughters became very ill. My neighbors uh, did as well. Um, some people who had had cancer and were in remission um, many months after living underneath the tower, their cancer came back. Um, and it was a really scary time. And we were very fortunate that we had incredible physicians who knew about this issue, who gave us the American Academy of Pediatrics Physician Statement, who were able to advise us on um, what we could do to reduce our exposure. And ultimately it was at our physicians urging that we left our home to sleep elsewhere. And when we did, we noticed a night and day difference. And what I realized was, CC, we were not alone. We were not the only family that this was happening to. And through being connected with you and other um, state and national and even global organizations and groups, we learned that this was the same story that was happening around cell tower base stations around the world, that people were experiencing symptoms, that there had been epidemiological studies, and people found that often within that 1,640 feet of um, being within a base station or an antenna, people experienced higher amounts of these common symptoms that sometimes it could take people years to be diagnosed with, um, for us, I think it was so drastic because we were um, in lockdown mode. The kids had been sent home from school. I had been sent home from work. And so we were being exposed to the cell tower 24 seven, the entire time we were not going anywhere. So it was very noticeable um, for us. And what I learned was that we had had bills in the Massachusetts um, State House for 10 years prior issue, although it was definitely made out to be when we started reporting this, 
But, you know, isn't this ubiquitous? Isn't EMFs from cell towers and devices everywhere? How do you reduce exposure when you have this electro smog? And what we are learning is you actually have more control than you think you do, especially in your personal environment. But when you have a cell tower radiating 24 seven outside your house, there's no way to connect it to ethernet. There's no way to put it on airplane mode. There's no way to be able to, um, you know, some of these Wi-Fi routers, you can put these Faraday cages around them or turn the power down, move them farther from your sleeping area. In the case of a cell tower outside your, um, outside your home, there are no options other than to move. And I feel very strongly that people should not have to choose between their homes and their health. Well, Courtney, thank you so much. You have worked tirelessly and you're doing what parents do. You protect your children and you've extended that out throughout your community. Can you share with us some of the inroads that your city council and your board of health have made? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the first things that we wanted to do was to increase the setback and keep towers out of residential neighborhoods. Um, not only did I not want this in my front yard or backyard, I didn't want this in anybody's front yard and backyard. And that was a recommendation, the 1,640 feet that came out of the New Hampshire Commission report, came out of several of those epidemiological studies. Um, and obviously with a strong municipal zoning code, you can have residential areas as the very last on the list in terms of preferred siting. You can prefer to site these commercial and industrial, um, you know, monopoles or antennas away from where people, um, you know, live, sleep and school, you know, these vulnerable areas. Now, obviously under our Telecommunications Act, we can't do that based on health or environmental effects, but there are 20 other valid reasons um, for which we can keep them, you know, farther away from these sensitive areas. So we do what we can. Our city council, one of the first things that we petitioned for was certified mail notification because none of the abutters on the Shacktown neighborhood um, knew about this tower. It was a deceptive 877 South Street commercial address, and yet it was being built from an unpermitted access point at the top of Alma Street. Um, and this is at the top of a residential um, neighborhood on residential land and none of us including our city councilor who had been our councilor for 10 years knew anything about this project our state representative is actually a neighbor two streets away and she was shocked that um, something like this could move forward and we have council to repermit the tower based on providing everyone notification so we would have due process and a voice in where things infrastructure of this size and impact would be in our community um now the mayor ended up saying no we can't do that so it went all the way back to the zoning board of appeals with full support and several letters from you know senators state representatives state councilors all behind this and supporting that effort so solidarity was incredible um also we had a, a nice letter from um, herman melville's estate which is a historic state right next door we learned that there was a native american indigenous deed to the land originally um, this should have gone through a proper nipa review which it did um, but what they said was because they didn't find artifacts it was not sacred land even though um even though it was and again because the historical society did not know the actual location of the tower there was no way for them to object um, to this so notification is really huge um, and so our city council passed certified mail notification so you can't just send something in the mail and hope that people read it um, and these you know, little newspaper print, one inch by one inch ads with deceptive address. It's just not going to fly because not everybody these days gets their 
um, notification. Not everybody subscribes to the newspaper. Not everybody sees that small print. So the council really wanted to make sure people were well um, informed and notified of these. Now they also sent it to our board of health to do an investigation mm -hmm. around the health effects that people were suffering around the 877 South Street cell tower. That took about eight months to actually get the ball rolling on that for a variety of different reasons. Once they did, we had some amazing doctors and subject matter experts who had been working with the neighbors and the injured people come forward and offer their expertise. The Board of Health did a 15-month investigation, found harm, issued a cease and desist against the tower. Verizon then sued. Uh, the city withdrew the cease and desist when they failed to fund the attorneys that the board had so diligently interviewed. And now it is in litigation and we are awaiting a decision. Oh my goodness. And so two groundbreaking things you have helped to be uh, brought forth in Pittsfield. One is for the first time in the United States, your Board of Health actually did a deep dive into this. And they came up with an emergency order that, that asked Verizon to please come to the table and let's figure this out. And instead of coming to the table, they went to the courts and said, we don't think Pittsfield has a right to stop this cell tower. So that was groundbreaking. And I love that document because they document all of the diagnoses that you and your neighbors have. They document the science. They document their findings with speaking with, you know, the doctors, the scientists, highly qualified engineers, as well as what the wireless industry said. And when they took a look at the gentleman that the industry brought in, this Dr. Eric Swanson, they listened to him say, there's no harm from microwave radiation at these FCC exposure levels. And he completely ignores thousands and thousands of peer-reviewed studies. But worse than that, I have such regard for your Board of Health because they didn't take anything at face value. They investigated everything. And when they went and looked at this Dr. Eric Swanson, they found that he has never published one paper on radio frequency microwave radiation, let alone biological effects. He's a physicist who specializes in quarks and other physics properties, but he has no expertise to comment on this topic. So to see your Board of Health document all of that is very empowering to all of our communities. And then secondly, when uh, a member of your community who owns commercial property said, we would be happy to have Verizon move that cell tower here. You know, it's not near a residential area and Verizon didn't come back to the table. Instead, they went to the courts. And when your mayor and city solicitor would not back your own board of health, to give them the funding to take this to court to get you guys and your neighbors back home, because I know many are couch surfing, many have been sleeping in their cars or in tents, and this has gone on for three years. Um, it's just incredible that they wouldn't come to the table. And so you guys have had to sue your town to give the Board of Health the right to do their job. So we're waiting for the courts to say, yes, we will release this injunction that the industry put against your Board of Health. So if that happens, then maybe we'll see you guys get back home soon. But in support of that, can you tell us about the amicus brief from the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards, because this is another first in the nation effort. Yeah, so what we discovered was um, through this process that our state board of health has a lot of powers to protect people from or injury. It is our board of health's duty and obligation and that is what they are charged with and not just protecting some people's health but every single person so one individual deserves to be protected from any hazard or nuisance so we have these um, state powers we have these board of health plenary powers and we discovered there is a legal handbook 
for the Massachusetts Boards of Health. And in it, there is a chapter on cell towers as an emerging health issue. And at the time that the third edition was printed, um, the uh, EHTCHD court case against the FCC, um, it had been heard, but the results um, at when the time the third edition came out, um, we had not had the win against the FCC that the standards were arbitrary and capricious and that they were based on, I think, 84 science back in 1996 before uh, these cell towers were placed everywhere and that this uh, radiofrequency radiation was more ubiquitous and that it ignored the biomedical effects, the biological studies, and especially to children. Um, and we had ch several children in our neighborhood who were experiencing those effects and that their parents testified, provided written and verbal testimony to our Board of Health. Our Board of Health, um, some of the members <coughs> took the time to on this. Um, and so the Massachusetts uh, Health Board um, actually was able to provide an amicus brief in terms of clarifying the powers that the Board of Health have to protect the health and safety of the residents to actually implement that cautionary, precautionary principle. If something can or may cause harm, we have the ability to remedy it. And we also have the ability to be a voice for people who can't be a voice for themselves. And it has been 1,026 days since we have been injured and displaced. And my daughter, she often will speak at open comments, either at Board of Health or City Council, and talk about how invisible she feels that when she speaks and the neighborhood speaks, um, who is listening and who is taking urgent action when they know that people are sick, injured and suffering and displaced. And um, the Massachusetts Health Boards, I cannot thank them enough for clarifying that yes, um, even though we have these FCC standards, if people are being injured, our 1996 Telecommunication Act, which deals with zoning over here, you cannot zone, you cannot deny a permit for a tower based on health and environmental effects, has nothing to do with a Board of Health's power once people are actively being injured by a cell tower. The answer can't be nobody takes care of these people. Right. We have asked every single one of our you know, our state representative, our senator, we have gone up and down the chain and everybody for the last three years has been finger pointing and saying, it's not my job. It's not my job. Oh, it's their job. Um, and like you said, we have amazing community solutions. Our community has rallied around us. They have found money for the GoFundMe. Our city councilors have. Um, you know, really pushed for the Board of Health to do this investigation. Um, last year, and we'll get into it, they uh, supported our petition for Pittsfield to recognize Global EHS Day. Our state representative has sponsored House Bill 2158 to recognize um, and document the number of people suffering with electromagnetic sensitivity in our MAVEN health recording system. So, so many good things are happening, and yet, my neighbors are not home. My children are not sleeping in their own beds. Um, and so really we're waiting for this decision to be able to say, who is responsible when people get sick? Our Massachusetts health boards and our boards of health are saying, listen, we understand that this is a new and emerging issue, the health and safety of these people in these neighborhoods, and we are going to do that. Our community has offered solutions. The parcel that the tower is sitting on has 60 acres of land and other people on the South Street commercial district have put their hand up and said, we'll take it. And we have people saying, we'll pay to relocate it and we'll actually clear the trees and we will do this for you. We have lawyers who are saying, we will support you pro bono. There is no reason why that this has had to go on as long as this has here in Pittsfield. When we are watching, um, we had a, a webinar 
um, and it was going to be for another Berkshire community about connecting about cell towers. And we had the Wyandotte community come on and we had uh, Congressman Sri Thanadar. We had State Representative um, Jim DeSana. So we've had, uh, you know, and you and I have done other um, forums in support for the cease and desist where we have had New Hampshire legislators come on and um, we are seeing that our mayors, our state representatives, our congressmen are getting educated about these issues and they are standing with the sick and with the suffering. And they are saying, you know what? Yes, technology is amazing and it has these benefits, but we cannot do this at the expense of the health of our constituents. And we need to cite these towers safer away from people. And we are seeing towers being removed we're seeing contracts not being renewed. We are seeing them being relocated to more appropriate places, even before people are injured. And here we have people who are actively being injured every day and displaced. Um, we would love to see some community uh, conversations around reaching out to Verizon and saying, you know, we really have to find solutions. We really need to make this better for this community. Well, good. And we're all praying for you that that court case comes through and comes through with the judge's decision soon. Uh, it's certainly not the only court case in Massachusetts. Just last week, we were at the Worcester Superior Court in support of Rutland, Massachusetts residents, where there is a cell tower application that's been approved on a private property in a residential area in between the middle school and the elementary school. And so it's a clear danger zone according to the science. So we're hoping and praying that these court cases start coming through to start holding these industries accountable. And again, as you say, the message is not no technology, it's safe technology. And I was grateful that you mentioned the New Hampshire report. This is the first government in the nation that has done the investigation into today's wireless safety and they document the conflicts of interest with the Food and Drug Administration, with the, food, uh, with the Federal Communications Commission and the wireless industry. So there's nobody up in Washington looking after you and I. And so it's wonderful when we have these local and state initiatives to help push that pressure up to the federal level to get the laws changed. But in the meantime, we have to keep protecting our communities. And as you said, this is happening all over the world, not just here. And for anybody interested in seeing the emergency order from the Pittsfield Board of Health or the New Hampshire report, please go to Massachusetts for Safe Technology. And if you go to our state efforts page, we've got those listed there for your review. Um, so Courtney, June 16th is World EHS Day. And I was so grateful that last year you reached out to see if we could partner together and do a forum, and we did. And I was thankful that you once again reached out this year to see if we could do a similar program. So do you want to tell us what we're planning for that? Yeah, so we're planning on June 16th from 6 to 7, and it may go till 7.30. Um, we are planning um, a Zoom call. Everybody is welcome to um, register. You'll have a link. Um, and we want to amplify the voices of those people who are electrosensitive. So often there is a shame and a stigma associated with speaking out around this illness. Um, people don't understand it. And it's really easy. And I think, um, you know, this happens to people who speak out, who they say, but like, and even, even our Board of Health in conversations with Verizon, they came back to us and said, do you own a microwave? Like, do you have a cell phone? You know, do you have a cell phone? You know, and um, so people are like, oh gosh, you know, maybe I can't speak out around these issues, even though I use hardwired technology or I might keep my cell phone in my car for if there's ever an emergency. Um, People have to realize that this has been a disease that has been recognized by the American with Disabilities Act for over 21 years. Um, there are so many organizations that recognize this. There have been 
uh, medical diagnostic codes for injury due to non-ionizing radiation. There are medical textbooks. There are literally clinics that specialize in treating electromagnetic sensitivity. There are documentaries made around the world that elevate the voices of the people who have been diagnosed. Um, and so I think as a community, we really do need to continue to come together, share our stories, raise awareness, continue to educate, continue to advocate. But the most important thing is taking action because people can't just send us prayers. You know, we're praying for you. We feel so sorry. We need policy change and we need protections. And what has happened traditionally is when people are sick, because of a new wireless installation or because of a source, a high EMF environment, which they were not in before and they're in now, they often call, right, their board of health or their city councilor or their select board, their town, and they say, we don't know what to do. And they call their Massachusetts Health Department and they say, well, we don't know what to do, right? And then you hear things from the industry like, well, nobody's ever sick by this. And then your people come back and say, well, you know, we spoke to uh, the wireless industry and they said, nobody ever gets sick by this. And we say, well, we have all these people who are sick. How do you know nobody's sick from this? And they say, well, nobody documents it anywhere, right? And so this house bill is the start of that. So I think on Global EHS Day, we'll have a Zoom call listen to the voices of those people who have lived experience um, and we will ask them the question as we did last year what do you want your legislators to know and what action do you want to see happen on your behalf and on behalf of the EHS community oh Courtney that is fantastic and you're absolutely right we need action on this because so many people are suffering and would never even think to connect their symptoms to today's microwave radiation exposures. So if you go out to Massachusetts for Safe Technology and you click on our events page, you'll be able to register to join us on May 16th from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you are in Massachusetts and you suffer from microwave sicknesses, for whatever degree, you know, it's, it's believed to be a spectrum disorder. So whether you're fully disabled or whether you just don't sleep right, or you get headaches, or nosebleeds, or nausea, or dizziness, or anxiety, um, or you know, brain fog, pain from unidentified sources, we would love to share your story. And if you would reach out to us through Massachusetts for Safe Technology, we would be so honored to have you featured. We'll guide you in how to prepare a one to two minute statement and join our forum and then we'll share that broadly so people can continue learning about this issue. So Courtney Gilardi, thank you so much for joining us today from Pittsfield, Massachusetts. You, your daughters, your husband, your neighbors are our heroes. So please send your support to Courtney and start working in your own communities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cece, for having me.